I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. It's time. Good morning, everyone. My name is Adam Clark. Um, I'd like to welcome you to community this morning. I'm really excited to lead uh, worship with you. Um, and by lead, I mean we sing the first word and you take it from there. <laughs> so um, if you could stand and we will worship. One of the thoughts that came through my mind is we, we just got done with softball season. And the last game, I didn't really even know what to say to the girls to inspire them. And it finally just said, you know, you got to just decide you want it. And then I thought about it today. It's like, that's the same thing with my faith. There's going to be stuff that I screw up. There's going to be mistakes I make. Um, there can be all the inspiration that Dan can pour into us and the Bible can pour into us, but we just have to decide we want it. So um, I'm glad that I'm here with a bunch of people that want it. So uh, let's lift each other up and worship and uh, do it. There's nothing worth more than could ever come close. Nothing can compare to your living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted. Tasted and seen 
be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Let us become more aware of your presence. Thanks for the microphone. I didn't realize it was that big of a deal. <laughs> Good morning. You guys can go ahead and have a seat for a second. I love the part of that song where it talks about his glory is like what we long for. Uh, when we had our SOS thing with the kids, that was kind of what I told them. Like, hey, as you go out and we do all this stuff, remind yourself you're glorifying God today and you represent him to our community. And that's kind of what we do as believers, when we go to our jobs and uh, school and things like that, we strive to bring him glory. Uh, first announcement of the day, uh, because Dan forgets, believe it or not, there are actually offering boxes out there. Um, but if you are wanting to give, you can do that through Easy Tithe or the offering boxes that are located by both entrances of the building. Uh, the second announcement we have is Cedar Point. Those of you who are part of the youth group, from those of you going into sixth grade all the way up through the people who just graduated, we're going to Cedar Point next week on Tuesday, but your money is due. If you forgot your money today, please just tell me you're going, because I have to order the tickets this week, and I need to know, and if you don't tell me, and then I don't order your ticket, then we miss out on the group rate and all that stuff. So please let me know if you're going to Cedar Point. Um, before... We move on to songs. I'm going to go ahead and invite Jim up to talk a little bit about our children's ministry. Sorry, I'm old. I can't, I can't see in the dark, so I have notes. Sorry. Um, good morning. Um, I'm Jim Miskevich. I have the uh, pleasure to be one of the elders here, um, and I am also a math teacher, and yesterday was one of the saddest days of the year because I went into Meyer. And all the 4th of July decoration stuff was on clearance and gone. And the new stuff was go back to school stuff. All the school supplies. Oh, it was very sad. Very sad. But it's, that, it's kind of that time of the year to just start thinking. Start, just start thinking about what's coming in the fall. So I'm here to give a plug for our kids' uh, ministry training that is coming up on August 21st. So it's for anybody that's currently serving in kids ministry so mark that down saturday morning august uh 21st um we're also always looking for new people but this morning i'm uh trying to encourage you to think about hey would you like to serve in our kids ministry if you want to connect with kids to interact with them to show christ's love to them we have ministries for nursery in the uh you know babies up through second uh second grade uh two years old. And then we have the toddler ministry, which is twos and threes. And then we have a pre-K, um, which is um, four and five-year-olds, then kindergarten through second grade. And then where I serve, third through fifth grade, those are the ministry opportunities that uh, you have. If you want more information, you can sign up on the website. There should be a sign up for training that is coming up uh, this week or next. Um, please sign up there. Also, 
If you want to come to training just to learn about it, if you come to training, you're not committed to serving in kids' ministry, um, but you're welcome to come. You can contact me, um, or you can contact a very nice person, a lot nicer and more beautiful than me, my wife, uh, Marissa. You can talk to her. Her information is also on the website, um, so please be thinking about that. Um, if you you know, want to look at it, and the commitment is once a month people serve in kids' ministry. Um, and if you just want to come for one or two months to see how it is, maybe it's your thing, maybe it's like, eh, I tried the nursery, let's try third through fifth, um, that's fine. You don't need to make a whole year commitment. Um, but one of the reasons why I love this church, why, hey, Jim, why do you go to community in Evansburg? I say because my kids love coming. They have friends here. They connect with their friends here. They have adults who take the time to prepare lessons, to interact with them, to laugh with them, that know them, that have grown up with them. And that's why I love coming here, because my kids love coming here. So if you want to know more, if you are thinking about it, talk to me. Go on the website for more information. Come to training, and we'd love to have you. Thanks, Jim. All right. Um, before I close this in prayer and kind of invite you guys to stand, uh, speaking of kids' ministry, the third through fifth graders, you guys are going to be heading to the gym uh, after I pray. And then the everybody else younger than that, you guys are all going to be heading down the hallway. So third to fifth, gym, everybody else, hallway. Okay, so if you guys would stand with me, I will pray, and then we will continue singing. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity we have to just be here today um, and that we can worship you freely. And I pray that we don't take that for granted and that we focus our hearts on you and, as the song said, that your Holy Spirit fills uh, this place today. I pray this in your name. Amen. Community microphone. Wow. Ever be 
There's somebody, Lord, that's here, and that's a message that uh, their heart needs. They are searching, 
and uh, finding other things, leaving them empty. Lord, would you show them that only you can do these things, only you can fill up a life, only you can satisfy. Would we see that in you this day, I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Hey, do you need, it's kind of a rainy, dreary, dreary morning, right? Okay, do you need a little, just kind of a heartwarming feeling here for a second? We're going to look at Daniel chapter 11 in a minute. Anybody need just a little encouragement? Okay, this is one of those awe, isn't that sweet moments? Are you ready for an awe, isn't that sweet moment? Okay, um, Dennis, uh, sorry to embarrass you here for a second. You were just camping with your family, and uh, your daughter's name is? Michelle is his daughter. I just, we were ripping apart the uh, carpet off the front of the platform this week, and I found written over here, it's so sweet, it says, Michelle loves dad. Oh, isn't that sweet? Wait, 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 it gets better, it gets better. It gets better. Over here, Dennis, it says, Dennis loves Mary. Oh, is it, isn't, isn't that sweet? Oh, I should have, I was going to say, <laughs> I should have asked that ahead of time. Uh, your wife's name, Dennis, is? Yeah, if it was if it was Gladys, that's not nearly as sweet. Uh, but uh, but that's good. And then the sweetest one of all, your your youngest son's name is Brett. It says right here, Brett loves soccer. There you go. Uh, so first thing, now, you know, I thought about this. I, I thought we could share that special moment with the heart. So I thought that'd be kind of cool. If I mean, if I found you know thirty years later, uh, you know, a message from my daughter written like that in Griffey, I, I would have felt that was special. And I thought maybe what we could do as a church is instead of pressing charges for vandalism to the Hartzell family, we could just make them pony up the money to recarpet the stage. Okay, uh, we could do that either way. So thought that would be a good solution for that. Okay, we are going to look at Daniel chapter 11 today, which means we're stinking close because there's only 11 and 12 left. But I need to go back to a couple weeks ago when we were talking about Daniel chapter 10. You might remember... I can hope, uh, that uh, when, we, uh, when we looked at Daniel chapter 10, it was the story of God sending Daniel a message. And the angel, the battle the angel had to try to get there and get that message to him, the opposition of the message. But you might also remember this. I don't know that when Daniel did receive the message, basically this was a message that floored him. This is a message that, I mean, broke him. He was sick from hearing the message. That's why our title up here is Cheer Up, Things Will Get Worse. <laughs> what an encouraging word. But the message that he received was not one of, all right, hey, things are good. The message was very much this. Now, I, I called it episode 10. And what we're going to do is go through the chapter kind of in different episodes I think it was about 12 years ago, maybe uh, somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, I was a teacher, and the word came one morning, speaking of teachers getting excited about things, that we were going to have a snow day. And if you think kids, yeah, if you think kids get excited about snow days, you don't know any teachers, uh, because teachers really live for this. They follow the weather forecast, and there's, there's a chance. Uh, and uh, not only was there one snow day, but they... Um, uh, the, the forecast was that we we're probably going to be shut down for a little while. And uh, so my wife and I, my, my daughter was off at of grad school, my son was off at of college, it was just my wife and I, and we were introduced to a guy by the name of Jack Bauer. Some of you might know who Jack Bauer is. Jack Bauer uh, was uh, always saving the world from something, whether it was a nuclear disaster or it was germ warfare or it was global warming. He was always, every week, he was saving the world from something. Uh, and uh, we discovered something that shall be known as binge watching. It wasn't really that big back then. We, we really ventured into that for the first time. And uh, you know if you're a binge, binge watcher when you find yourself saying just one more? <laughs> Have you ever been there? Uh, just one more episode, we, we can watch that. But, uh, but anyway, we got into that. But I did something that I think all of you will agree with my wife on this was particularly irritating. And I actually do this all the time when we watch something like that. I like to get online and find out, you know, season four, whatever we're watching, and there's summaries of all the episodes. And I read them all ahead of time. Yeah, I know. Uh, she hates it. And especially when she says, do you think so-and-so is going to live? And I say, you want me to tell you? <laughs> and she gets really mad at me, actually, over the whole thing. But I, I like to know. I, I, I guess that's weird. But I, I like to know. I don't like the mystery. I feel a whole lot better if I know who's going to live and die and everything like that. So I'll read through the whole series. But you just read this little paragraph that says, is a summary. Well, we're going to take a few minutes at the beginning here, and as we go through the first 20-some verses of chapter 11, I'm 
just going to give you the episode summaries of what's going on. Because this section of history was prophecy for Daniel. Because this is going to happen three or four hundred years later. But it's history for us. And we're going to give you just some of the details in there. Again, the amazing thing about this is how accurate it was. I mean, how you can see that play out in history. So we're going to run through the first nine episodes. Okay, kind of quick here. I'm going to give you the summary. I'm going to cheat. Uh, we're going to go there to the summary. The first, uh, the first episode we'll call Breaking Up is Hard to Do. This was the prophecy uh, that first of all, Persia would have three more kings. And then they would have another king by the name of Xerxes. And... Yeah, uh, make sure I said the right king. And then there would be a great king that would come from Greece. And some of you might remember this from some of the other prophecies we looked at. This great king would be Alexander the Great. But when Alexander the Great uh, had conquered the world after 10 years, there was nothing more to conquer. He did not have a great succession plan. There was no family to leave the kingdoms to or anything like that. So that's where the breaking up is hard to do came in. His kingdom broke up into four sections. And to set the stage for the other episode, I've got to give you a little geography here for just a second. Uh, so you have to visualize a map here, okay? Uh, I, right here, I think this will work. I'm the Great Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, okay? So just up on this side of me is a kingdom still there today. Back then it was called the Seleucids. That's one of the kingdoms that broke up from Greece. Uh, but it was the, uh, today is called Syria, Keep it simple, we'll just say Syria. Then if you go down, down along my coast here, there's a beautiful land, which is Israel, uh, down through here. But then right down over here is Egypt, okay? Ptolemy was the name of the, of the Greek guy that was a split off in these four kingdoms. But I want you to remember these two kingdoms, the southern kingdom of Egypt and the northern kingdom of Syria, because they're going to play all into the rest of the story. Okay, so the story begins, and this would be a great little mini-series here, here to watch it sometime next time it snows. Uh, my second episode I'm calling, you can see it. Here's why. Uh, this, this battle, if you want to say, between Syria and Egypt really begins with a little plot here to send a woman from the south, her name was Bernice, up to infiltrate the north by marrying the king of the north. Okay, and she goes up there. Now, the only problem with that is <laughs> the king already had a wife. And imagine this. He wasn't, she wasn't crazy about this plan. Uh, so she took matters into her own hands. She poisoned her husband and killed the wife and her son. <laughs> okay, so sweet little story. Uh, that's how it starts off here. So this little conflict there. Now, I should have said, too, if you have Syria and you have Egypt, right in here between is the Jordan River and the, well, you got Sea Galilee, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea. Uh, right in here is, you know, where God's people are. They are in the battle line of the whole time, everything that goes on here. They're right in the middle of everything that's going on. It starts with this little conflict over the women or the queens, and then full-fledged civil war breaks out. The southern king says, hey, we're going to get revenge for what you did to Bernice, killing her, and uh, we're going to go up there. And there's a back and forth going through the land of God, the beautiful land, as they call it, that goes on for a while here. In fact, it goes on uh, so long, we'll have to say the next episode was actually more of the same civil war going on. And... Um, Sorry, I have to check my notes to remember exactly what the highlight of that civil war was. There we go. Uh, okay, in this one, the southern kingdom, so Egypt actually wins out and uh, comes to power, but the king, who I think by this time is, uh, is Ptolemy IV or something like that, but the king is actually so wicked when he goes back into Egypt, there's so much debauchery and evil that his kingdom falls apart. And as a result of his kingdom falling apart, the guy that comes to his throne is his five-year-old relative. So they have a five-year-old king down in the southern kingdom, okay? Which brings us to episode number five, the guy in the northern kingdom whose name is Antiochus, there we go, uh, the great, decides that he says, five years old, I think I can whip this guy, and they, again, they're battling, and they're going crazy. Now, eventually, eventually, Antiochus uh, gets a little bit too aggressive. He goes after some things that he shouldn't have, and Rome steps into the picture, and he's getting defeated, and he actually has to send some people as a, as a, uh, like to, to appease Rome, and one of them is his son, uh, but his son actually comes to power. Now, sorry, I know I'm 
firing through this here. I probably am not whetting your appetite for just one more episode, but that's what I kind of want, wanted to do here. But anyway, his son in episode six is this guy by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. And we mentioned him before because a lot of times in the prophecy of Scripture, there is like a near fulfillment. This is going to come. And then there's a in the last days fulfillment. And you might remember when we talked about this guy, Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, you know, his father was Antiochus the Great, so he was like, I could top that, Epiphanes. Uh, And when he comes to power, he also gives us a vision of somebody else, okay, that is going to be way in the future, okay? So this guy, Antiochus Epiphanes, gives us his vision of somebody way in the future. Do you remember who that is? Anybody? The Antichrist, that's right. Okay, good. One person remembers. Uh, So that is yet to come. So this happened. This guy came to power. The Antichrist is yet to come. Uh, For episode seven, I just labeled it, it's about time. And uh, there's several places in a few verses that use the phrase at the appointed time. And it just pointed out the idea that God designed all this, and God used this, and God was still in control. Though the things for the people of God became very difficult, God was still in control. At the appointed time, this happened. At the appointed time, this happened. At the appointed time. And one of those things that happened is even this. This Antiochus at this time was doing some serious hating on the people of God. Okay, let's read just a little bit about that. For the ships of Kittim, that actually uh, were the Romans, uh, shall come against him, and he shall be afraid. Now, again, this is written prophetically. It hadn't happened yet, but it does happen eventually in great detail. And he shall be afraid and withdraw and shall turn back, and he will be enraged. Okay, he's been beat. He's ticked. And he's going to take it out on somebody. And he is going to take action against the Holy Covenant. So he has been beaten by the Romans. He comes back. He's ticked. He's mad. He's going to make somebody pay. How about the Jews here? Yeah, let's make them pay. So he's going to take action against the Holy Covenant. He shall turn back and pay attention to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Those who say, forget God and join him. He's liking them. Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and the fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering. So he's, he's destroying their worship system. He's destroying the temple. And they shall set up an abomination that makes desolation. And, and we talked about this before, that event that is called the abomination of desolation. So this Antiochus Epiphanes has been defeated. He's ticked. He's going to make somebody pay. He goes back to Jerusalem. And uh, he says, hey, we'll make these folks pay. We're going to destroy their worship. We're going to destroy their temple. We're going to defame uh, you know, everything about this. We're going to tear down any uh, way that they have to worship because basically we're against God. Now, remember, this guy gives us a vision of somebody else who's, who's going to come. He's a forerunner for somebody else. There's one more little chapter in the thing. We'll call that, I'm sorry. Something else, something else just to kind of wrap up that section. He shall seduce with flattery. This is Antiochus. Uh, and v- those who violate the covenant. So in other words, those who will leave their God become his friends. He's going to seduce them with flattery. Okay. But the people who know their God are going to do what? That's a good verse, isn't it? I forgot I had that one in there. That's awfully good. All right. So some are going to forget God, and they're going to follow this guy, but those who know their God. And this is why we stress around here, what's the first step I would like for you all to do? Simply know God. Okay? Know him as Lord and Savior. Grow in your knowledge of him and who he is, because those who know their God are going to be able to stand firm, and those who know their God are going to take action. Now, episode number nine and uh, I was getting weirder and weirder on my title. Uh, it's going to talk. We're going to read about it in a minute, The Wise Ones. <laughs> Do you remember? There's a song that goes, The Wild Ones, The Real Wild Ones. Anybody? Anybody? Okay, anyway, that got in my head. That's why it says that. He's the wise one. He's the real wise one. Okay. I knew that was going to be weird. Fortunately, my wife's down the hallway today, so she can't tell me later how weird I am. Okay. Uh, but the, the wise ones, the real wise ones, here's what the, it talks about there. And the wise among the people. Okay. You get it here? This guy is oppressing the people of God. But the wise among the people shall make many understand. They're going to continue to share the truth. They're going to make many understand. They're going to explain what's going on here. Uh, Though for some days, okay, so they're going to follow God 
That means everything's going to work out great for them. Wrong. For some days, they shall stumble by the sword and flame by captivity and plunder. So they're going to serve God. They're going to testify about God. They're going to make other people understand. And they're going to face incredible persecution. And when they stumble, they shall receive a little help. We'll come back to that phrase in a minute, but in a minute here. And many shall join them. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, join themselves to them with flattery. Okay. So, obviously, when you follow God, when you do the right thing, everything works out well, right? You see that in there very plainly. No, you do not. But what you do see is great evangelism in the midst of persecution. Let me say that word again. What you do see is a great evangelism. People sharing the message of Jesus Christ, sharing his love, sharing the message of the gospel with other people in the midst of persecution. And folks, if you study history and the history of the church, this is what happens. Okay, a lot of times things are good, we're rolling along, we're comfortable in what's going on. The times when you see, and the places around the world, I think where you're seeing the most evangelism right now is in places where there is difficulty for the people of God. This is where it is. And that's how it was here. So evangelism grows up here in the midst of persecution. And we need to remember, and you're not going to like this statement because I don't like it, but we need to remember that God allows his people to periodically suffer if it meets his ultimate end. Okay, that's not popular preaching, but that's what we need to hear sometimes. God allows his people to periodically suffer if it meets his ultimate end. And in this case, his ultimate end is that the, the whole, that Jesus would be born uh, during the time of the Roman Empire and everything like that, and he's orchestrating this all together for the coming of his son. Okay, these things are taking place during what we call the intertestament period uh, between the end of the book of Malachi, if you want to say, and the beginning of the book of Matthew. And this is setting the stage for the coming of the Lord Jesus. And God is orchestrating all this. Everything is happening according to his plan. And he continues to work in our lives in that way. In that not everything is going to be exactly how we think it should be, but God is orchestrating his plan. Now, I said we'd refer back to that phrase, a little help. I wanted to mention that because the word for that, azure, is, um, is translated in other places in scriptures, is translated help meet. And it's also, the, every time it is used, it talks about it, it's kind of the idea that God will fight alongside of us. So he says, yes, the difficulty will come, but God will be there fighting alongside of us. If you remember from the song, the God of angel armies is always on our side. And that's the message that we, that we can uh, hold on to. That's the truth that we can grab on to. Now, let's get to uh, episode 10 again. Okay, cheer up. Things are going to get worse. Now, again, what we've been looking at in my rapid fire through there is now history. When Daniel wrote it, it was prophecy. And... Um, I, you could spend a long time going into the details of how incredibly accurate the prophecy is. And when you understand how accurate it was, that it was fulfilled to the T, we can trust the prophecy of it that is to come. And as I said, this, this also is very common in Scripture that you'll have a prophecy of, hey, this is going to happen now, and then this is going to happen down the road. Well, here we go now into the prophecy concerning the end times. So we're going to pick it up in verse Number, uh, I think it's, I forget where it is, 34 or 36 or something like that. But anyway, the king shall do as he wills. This is talking now end times. We're moving towards the Antichrist. He shall exalt himself. He shall magnify himself above every god, and he shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper. Remember this. He will prosper till the indignation is accomplished. For what is decreed shall be done. He's going to be large and in charge. He'll pay no attention to the God of his fathers or to the ones beloved by woman. He shall not pay attention to any other God, for he shall magnify himself above all. He will honor the God of fortresses, the God of wars. Instead of these, O oh God, I'm sorry, a God whom his fathers did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He shall deal with the strong fortresses with the help of a foreign God. So basically, this guy is having a good time. Okay, he's winning. Okay, victory after victory, and he's ignoring God. Let's see something else about him. And those who acknowledge him, he shall load with honor. Don't miss that, okay? Okay. Those who acknowledge him, he shall load with honor. You're going to want to be on his side for a while here. 
This is the Antichrist, but uh, those who acknowledge him, he's going to load with honor. He'll make them rulers over many and divide the land for, for a price. At that time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, but the, the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind and the chariots and the horsemen with many ships. And he shall come into the countries and shall uh, overflow and pass through. And he shall come into the glorious land, that's Israel, and tens of thousands shall fall, but they shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab and the main part of the Amorites. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and silver and of the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Cushites shall follow in his train. But news from the east and the north shall alarm him, and he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction, and he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious over him. Uh, and the glorious holy mountain. Sorry, I want to fire through this. I just want us to capture that idea. This guy is going to be successful. Okay? People are going to follow him, and those who follow him, he's going to reward. If you want to be on the winning side, or what appears to be the winning side of this time, you want to be on his side. There will arise an evil one in this world that is going to come to power. And he's going to be successful in everything that he does. He's going to set this up, and you're going to look, whoa, who's winning here? Uh, this, guy, this guy's winning. And like I said, we are going to maybe say we want to be on his side, but look at the end of this verse. Yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. That's the very end of chapter 11. I love that phrase. Everything's rolling. He's cruising. He's winning. And then the Bible says, yet he's going to come to his end with no one to help him. In the book of uh, Thessalonians, uh, when they're talking about the Antichrist, the Bible says that Jesus will destroy him with the breath of his mouth. I love that. I love that. This guy is rolling. He's large and in charge. Things are rolling his way. And uh, t uh, things have been very hard on the people of God. But at that appointed time, Jesus is going to come, and he's going to destroy him with the breath of his mouth. I, I visualize, you know, you're done. <laughs> You're gone, buddy. I hope you had a good time because your days are rolling are over. Okay. So now when we look at all these things, when we look at uh, what has happened here and we think about the fact that this day is coming, there are difficult days coming even for the children of God, I want to give you some ways that we can prepare for the end times. Okay. Uh, and again, you know, I said this before. Uh, when I started this, when you get into talking about prophecy and talking about the end of time, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm standing out on the corner, you know, with a sign, you know, the end is near, you know, I'm a nut job or, or what, whatever like that. But the truth is, I don't know how else to say this, if I'm going to teach all of scripture, I'm going to teach this. And it says these days are coming. Okay. Uh, th this is happening. So what are we going to do? Number one, I want to suggest it like this. I use the term brace yourself. I have a bunch of little words that start with B. But uh, a lot of this is in your mindset. I just want us to remember these days are coming. And it's kind of a win-win situation in that if I look and I say, hey, wait a minute, if things get better, great. I mean, if, if things get, uh, you know, improved pretty good, great. I'm, I'm all for that. But if things keep getting worse, that's great. Jesus is coming back sooner. Okay, and kind of look, look, at, look at things like that. Because there are some things you know, I see people going crazy about. You know, how about inflation? Have you seen the price of milk, cheese, eggs, whatever, gas, uh, whatever? And it's like, oh, man, this is terrible. You know, when you read the Bible, this is one of the things that happens at the end. And you kind of say, okay, we got, we got this. We're okay. And, again, there will be times when things are very difficult for the people of God. They're going to be hard. Remember that uh, Daniel heard this prophecy and it, it made him sick. You know, I don't, I don't even want to go this. Uh, I always say this. It's kind of a weird, weird little thought there, but it's actually probably true. I think the key, my wife and I are coming up on 39 years this week. How about that? Uh, I always say, oh, you know, she, she's not here and she's the one that deserves the applause. So, um, but, uh, but anyway, 30, 39 years, I always say the key to our happy marriage is that she keep her expectations low. That's the secret. Low expectations, honey. That is the key. Uh, if you keep it like that, we're going to be happy. We're, we're going to keep going. And I don't want to just give you that message. I don't want you to say, hey, for the future, I want you to have low expectations. But I do want you to understand things could get worse. I don't know the timing of things. I don't know if, you know, you know the inflation is going to go, bazoo, bazoo, 
you know, things are going to collapse. I don't know. I don't know if that's happening in my lifetime, your lifetime, or the kids that are down the hallway's lifetime. I, I don't know. But what I do know is I'm not going to be surprised. I'm not going to be devastated by this. I know that these things are coming. Okay? So I want to brace myself. A second thing that I would suggest strongly in preparing is that we band together. Now, I had a pastor friend who used to uh, write a blog called Comments on the Passing Parade. And he would take all the current events and say what he thought about them. I don't really do that a lot because <laughs> I just figure who cares what I think. Uh, however, I'm gonna, I, I break that on this. And this is just an observation. Okay, I'm not preaching right now. You disagree with me if you like. But one of the things that has been incredibly troubling to me over the last, whatever, we've been going through 16 months or whatever like that, and, and I've mentioned this before, but in every situation where, yeah, as a nation, we've been hit and has faced hard times, there was a bonding together. Okay, some of you are old enough to remember 9-11 and what happened. And we're all New Yorkers. I mean, people of Boston who hate New Yorkers. We're New Yorkers! Uh, you know, we're, t we're together. We might even root for the Yankees to win, you know, uh, because, you know, we're going to bond together. What we have seen in the last 16 months is the exact opposite of that. There has been division in everything. And anger and fear are the tools that are used, and everything that can be done continues to drive people apart. And that is not just in the world, that is also in the church. Things are driven apart. If I can pick on the Baptists here for a second. Uh, second, uh, second. The, uh, you, know, the, the, you have your General Baptists, you have your Southern Baptists, you have your American Baptists, you have your Independent Baptists, you have your Independent Fundamental Baptists. And recently in the news, and I know I follow a news feed that many of you would not, but uh, recently in the news there's all this stuff in the national news about the Southern Baptists splitting and dividing and fighting. And, uh, and I thought, ah, good, we can have some more Baptist groups uh, like that. And, you know, and I know there are places where there needs to be separation. I understand that. But yet at the same time, I, I just think that's all we're doing anymore is finding you know, differences that we have with other people and fighting. And, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of lost in that. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago I had driven over to Ohio. What just happened? Uh, I had driven over to Ohio. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, <laughs> if Adam was still up here, I'd have some serious uh, worries. Um, <laughs> but uh, the uh, but anyway, I'd driven over to Ohio and meet, met with an old friend of mine from high school, and it's it's kind of funny. We uh, we met, we we ate lunch and sat for a couple hours, and then we played eighteen holes of golf uh, together. He's from Pittsburgh, where I grew up. And uh, in the course of the conversation, uh, he's a friend that we email a couple times a week, usually back and forth, just, uh, you know, stay in, French, in, in contact. In the course of the conversation, we realize there's only two things we agree on, okay? We agree, again, we're both from Pittsburgh, that the Pirates are one of the worst teams that baseball has ever seen uh, this year, that they're just terrible, and that Ben Roethlisberger should have retired at the end of last year. We agree on those two things. That's the end of it. Any other issue, we were totally opposite. But... We're still friends. <laughs> we can still talk. Uh, I can still look at him and not say you're a moron because you disagree with me. I could say if you agree, I, I don't have to say to him, hey, if you love me, you'd, or you'd agree with me on stuff like that. But that's kind of where we've gotten today, where things are so ripped up out like that. If we are going to face difficult times ahead, if that is where the church is headed, folks, we're going to need each other. I mean, real, real simple. Uh, we're going to need e each other, and what has happened in recent years that tears apart families, and, and or recent months, I should say, tears apart families and tears apart churches, don't you think that's just going the totally the wrong direction? If Because as we prepare for a future, we want to do the opposite. We want to band together. The third B I want to show you is book it. And for this, I want to take a peek into Daniel chapter 12 for a second and look at the first verse here. The most important thing in preparing for the end times. At that time shall rise Michael, getting back to the angel here, the great prince who has charge of the people. And there shall be a, t listen to this next phrase. There shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a na nation till that time. It's going to be a time like can compare to. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. The people of God will be delivered. Who are the people of God? Everyone whose name shall be found in the book. 
Okay, And I want to say this very clearly because definitely we have a time coming. And again, I don't know whose lifetime it's during. I'm not saying, you know, by next month this is going to happen. I'm not giving you any of that. I don't, I don't know when. But there is a difficult time coming. And sometimes we look at the situations of life and the, those who have forsaken God, things are going well. And those who are following, for those who are following God, things are going poorly. And what we need to understand is they may be going well now for those who forsake God, but they will end badly. And they may be going badly now for those who follow God, but they will end well. And what is the dividing line? It comes down to whether or not your name is written in the book. In the book of Revelation, it says, and all who dwell on earth will worship it. That's the beast. That's the false prophet. That's the Antichrist. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of, li- uh, I'm sorry, book of life of the Lamb who was slain. The dividing line there, okay, those who things may go bad, but they are going to end well are the ones whose names are written in the book of life. And those whose names are not in the book of life, things maybe look like they're going good, but they will end poorly. There's a guarantee on that. That's what God says. So how important it is that my name be written in the book of life. Now, that's church talk, I realize. That's Bible talk that you may not be familiar with. What does it mean to have your name written in the book of life? That life is given to those who trust in Jesus Christ. He came to lay down his life that we could have life. And when we call on him to be Savior and Lord, when we trust him for forgiveness of sin and we say, I'm going to put my trust in him and him alone. I'm not going to trust in going to church, good work, giving money, any of that stuff. I'm going to trust in Jesus Christ because I have a need. I am separated from God from my sin and I'm going to trust in him. When I do that, the Bible says our name is taken from, uh, we're, we're translated really, if the Bible talks about from death to life, our name is written in the book of life. I heard a preacher say this week that it's written in the blood of Christ and it is not erasable. Okay? And that's the dividing line as far as those who are during the hard times going to have it hard but going to end well or those who during the hard times are going to end, have it good but it's going to end poorly. The dividing line is having our name written in the book of life. One last thing I want to show you here that I think is very important. The last B that came up with is the word broadcast. In verse number 3 of Daniel chapter 12, still sneaking in here. And those who are wise, okay, going back to the wise ones, remember what the wise did before? They told people the truth. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky. It says in the end days, those that, uh, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars wherever sh- will f- shine. Sorry, I did a lousy job of reading that. Those who turn many to righteousness. Remember what the wise are doing? They're spreading the truth. Remember what, the, what are the wise doing here? They're turning many to righteousness. Listen, folks, righteousness is only found in one place, or I should say righteousness is only found in one person, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. Okay? It doesn't mean I'm changing the way everybody's living. It means I am turning people to righteousness that is only found in Jesus Christ. In other words, this is those who are sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is those who are sharing his love with people. This is a... Old illustration. I've used it a couple times before, but I, I, I think it is the perfect illustration. I'm teaching one day, and uh, kids are bored. I know some of you are like, couldn't be. Must have been a younger you now. We're never bored. Uh, but, uh, but I'm teaching one day, and the kids are getting bored in class, and I thought, ah, I need to do something different. And we were, we were talking something about the end times. Uh, I think we might have even been in the book of Revelation. And I said, hey, tell me this. I said, this is your last day on earth. What do you want to do? And I went around the room. It's your last day. What do you want to do? And I was just thinking, yeah, I'd kind of like to, I still want to see the Grand Canyon. Ronnie and Bass, Bass and I were just talking about that today. I still want to see the Grand Canyon. I don't know if I'd make that my last day of Earth journey, but, uh, but I thought that'd be fun. You know, maybe uh, whatever you think, you know, you want to go parasailing. Uh, I don't know what, you, no, don't do that. That's, that's fun, but it's not that great. Uh, but what, whatever you have in your list, I want you to think about that. If I were to ask you, this is your last day on earth, what are you going to do? And I was just trying to make it fun, and we started going down the room, and this one person wants to, you know, go to the, uh, somewhere in the mountains. This one person wants to go jet skiing. This one person wants to do that, and different things like that on their last day. Get the one kid, and he says, my last day on earth? He said, I want to go to North Carolina and talk to my grandfather. He doesn't know Jesus. 
<laughs> yeah, the rest of us were like, uh, we just want to have fun. Uh, you know, and, and this was this incredibly spiritual statement that he made, but, uh, but it grabbed a hold of all of us and thought, yeah, that's where it is. And I guess, look at the message here. These hard times are coming. Okay, those whose names in the book of life, those, those whose names are written in the book of life, they'll shine forever, okay? Things are going to be tough, but they're going to end well. And those who turn many to righteousness, like the stars forever, will shine. And as we think about the end times, okay, one, one last stupid illustration. Uh, Francis and I went down to uh, uh, Potato Creek on Friday to take a hike. And, uh, you know, last couple years, mosquitoes have not been bad. Uh, if you think that Frances is a warmer person than I am, that is not true. I am much warmer than she is because whenever the two of us are together, the mosquitoes find me and not her. Just so you know, uh, so I'm a much war warmer person. But we, uh, we had sat down by the water and we ate our lunch. And I said, oh, we don't need bug spray. We're fine. We're going to take a hike into the woods. Wrong. Uh, the back of my neck is just chewed up. Uh, and I spent the whole trip slapping myself in the back of the neck. And one time I stopped so the dog could get a drink, it chewed up my legs too. Uh, so I am one big mosquito bite right, uh, right now. Uh, and, uh, t you know, torn up from this thing. And I thought about, how, okay, how stupid it is. We brought bug spray. In fact, I stopped the car when we were leaving and said, I got to get bug spray. Went in and got it. But I didn't put it on. I didn't do anything about it. Okay. Pretty stupid, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you are. Uh, that, that's true. But here's, here's the thing. We hear this message of the fact that this is all real. Okay. First nine episodes have come true t with incredible detail. Number 10 is going to come true too. The day is going to come when this world is going to be under the control of an antichrist. But his end shall come very suddenly. And those whose name is written in the book of life will have eternal life. What are you going to do about it? I left the bug spray in the car. It didn't do me much good. I hope that uh, what we talk about here today and the understanding and the belief in what is coming will cause us to take some action and do something good. Not just leave it in the car. Not just, hey, that was, yeah, someone, I kind of bored me with the whole history stuff. But oh, that's interesting about the Antichrist. That's pointless. What is it going to do as far as impacting us? Because the Bible says that those who turn many to righteousness, those who are pointing folks to Jesus Christ, will shine forever as the stars. Worship team is going to come back up, and we're going to close in a song. As we do, the most important question I ask you today is on that dividing line between those who... Uh, things end well for and those who don't is is your name written in the book of life and I know that's a little church speak and I, I hope I'm not confusing you with that what in the world is that guy talking about but it, it is very simple it, it is a biblical terminology that talks about those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and the most important question is is your name there and I want to encourage you, I'm around afterwards, I can talk to you or introduce you to somebody who would love to tell you more about that if that is a confusing point to you. Because that's the most important thing we're talking about here, is your name written in the book of life. And I would say for those of us who we know our name is written in that book, I hope you look and say, hey, folks, we often need a wake-up call. This business of sharing our faith with others, telling other people about Jesus, we can move away from that so easily. Just get... Other things distract us, and we're busy about everything else. And we've been too busy fighting about politics and everything. I have to worry about the fact that folks don't know Jesus Christ. So maybe today serves as a wake-up call. Says, hey, that's what people need. And maybe rather than making my opinion on this known to somebody, maybe they need to know that Jesus Christ, God's only Son, gave His life for them. Maybe that's the message that God would bring us to today. If you would uh, join me in standing as we worship before we leave.
stands between us there is no other name but the name that is Jesus he who was and still is and will be through it all so come what may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning I know I will never be alone. I know I will never be alone. There'll be another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding? Good you've been to me I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be so if a message about the end times, if you feel like and that was designed to scare anybody, it really wasn't. It was designed, well, I guess, unless your name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, I guess I, I will. I, but for the rest of us, what we just sang about, remember that little help. Difficult times are coming, but we're not alone in that. Okay, there is another in the fire. There's one that will walk through this with us. And again, I, I want to say, I'm not saying this week's things are going to get worse. I don't know the timing of everything. God is in, in his infinite wisdom, hasn't told us everything, but he has told us that we need to trust him. 
okay, to be prepared for the end times, we need to trust him. That is definitely what he has told us. One other thing I wanted to mention, I did not talk at all today, for those of you that are familiar with studying the end times, I did not talk at all about the departure of the church. That will be a future date. It wasn't in our text, and I didn't talk about that as far as where that fits in. So, uh, but that is coming at a later date to you. Pretty exciting, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it just one more episode? Uh, okay, with that, did, did, no, we didn't pray. Let's pray. Uh, Father, again, uh, the message of your truth is going to get scrambled by me. Uh, Holy Spirit, would you clarify it in our lives and in our hearts, I pray. And, uh, and may, we, may it impact our living. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.
above all humans.